Thank, thank you so much, Professor. I think this is uh, this is extremely interesting and very topical. Uh, you know, if you think about how to pair academics with practice. To, yesterday, I was in a meeting with the uh, the, the CEOs of the top banks uh, here in uh, in Europe, uh, talking about you know the upcoming stress test. And I think that um, um, you know the lessons that you give us. And, and, and maybe also the lesson not to fall in the pitfall of hubris and thinking that we know more than we do. Um, the way that we now to try to deal with this, and it's very pragmatic and very uh, very down to earth, much more down to earth maybe than, than, than what you just uh, explained to us, is that we say, let's run this stress test, but as a, as a, as a supervisor, let's not yet attach uh, any um, any uh, any uh, biting policy actions to it. Uh, so so it, there's also a role in just making sure that people start thinking about it, that we unleash, if you like, the intellectual capacity that is there within these banks by just mm -hmm. forcing them to start working on this. Um, so maybe yeah. that is also a way to, 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 to pair what I thought you said so very well in the beginning, that we make sure that on the one hand, we don't overestimate our capacity and our capabilities, but on the other hand, we shouldn't fall in, into inaction because the, 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 the gravity of the situation. I am looking around and see there's a chat function in which people can, can ask, but there's also panelists. And I know my fellow board member, Philip, is here, and I'm sure that that wonderful mind of his has been triggered by what you have said. So I'm, I'm <laughs> seeing... Um, so, while people are maybe um, uh, they're trying the, the, the chat function to see whether maybe Philip or maybe one of the other people in the in the room that I can see here uh, want to kick off the, uh, the the discussion. Yeah, let me just say one thing that um, I I can understand that there may well be gains to just getting financial sectors to be thinking more more about climate change and and, and the stress tests puts it on their radar screen in ways that perhaps wasn't. So I, I can certainly see potential virtue there. But it, it, it'd be nice if, we, if these stress tests are going to continue going forward to start thinking through some of these more um, dynamic and probabilistic issues. That's right. No, no, that, that's very clear. And I think that is the way forward. Um, now, don't be shy. <laughs> I, maybe, you know, another thing that occurred to me, but, you know, who am I uh, here uh, to be your principal discussant? That shouldn't be the case. Um, <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> well, you, you know, I'm, I don't know whether anybody told you, but I, I'm, I'm only trained as a, as, as a lawyer. And lawyers look at this from a, a, a precautionary principle kind of way of thinking that, that yeah. it might be that there's even, you know, a, a preponderance of, of likely acceptable outcomes. But if there are certain outcomes that are just not acceptable, uh, yeah. it means one, uh, one needs, to, uh, one needs to, 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 to act. Do you, do you think there is a risk of central bank? Uh, so, so, so I think, it, you know, we, we completely accept and then we are completely in agreement, you know, what you put in your last slide in terms of governance, uh, governments having to take the lead here. But do you, nevertheless, that having been said, think there's a risk of, um, um, uh, you know, the, the central banks falling short of what they should be doing in the period to come? Yes, that's an interesting question. I don't see that at the moment as the, the problem. I'm a, I'm a little bit more concerned that central banks expose themselves into setting up public expectations that they, that they can do more than they really can accomplish, which I think is important. You know, central banks have in many places established relative to other government agencies, um, good reputations and as and, and being you know, somewhat you know, politically independent and being um, more, uh, more reliable policymakers. And I, and, and I just want to be good not to kind of lose that, that credibility. Right. Uh, thank you. I, I, I actually do have a question now in, in the other chat, which uh, apparently okay. also functions. Uh, it's, it's by uh, Wolfgang Lemke. Um, uh, and and I guess it's the, the, the it's functions that I have to read it to you because uh, the, there is no possibility for for uh, the, the, the Wolfgang to speak uh, himself. How to pick the right social discount factors? Uh, what is the damage slash risk uh, of taking the wrong one? Yeah. <clears throat> so discounting here is we have to be a little bit careful about how we. What we mean exactly by the discount factor 
if we're just thinking about social cash flows and there's no single discount factor because given the uncertainty, the way we have to discount depends on, uh, is, is which I have to do stochastic discounting, discount uh, different futures differently. And that's, you know, that's a whole nature, that that's a whole lesson coming out of um, financial economics that carries over to social valuation. On the other hand, if you're going to imagine, there's some notion, you know, in, those are for kind of so-called marginal valuations or, or, um, or, or um, there is some notion of discounting that shows up in terms of trying to devise social preferences. How much should I care about that? Um, the, um, some, uh, how much I should care about the future versus now? And, and, and in our own calculations, we ended up using a very low discount rate, but that, but that, but not for particularly good reasons. That's part of the the uh, um, the statement of social preferences. So there's both there's what shows up in the type of probabilistic discounting we're doing is uh, is it, it depends on how averse you are to the uncertainty, how much you weight these potentially bad outcomes without your best guesses versus uh, the, the the more pure form of discounting about how important you're going to treat future generations relative, on the relative to current ones, and then and they're both important, and. I can show you their consequences, but I, you know, it's, 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 I can't tell you what those, what the uh, social discount rate should be. That's a, that's a decision that's, that's not part of, um, that's not part of a rule of a sci uh, of scientific input here. Right? That's, that, that's a statement for what, uh, for policymaker preferences. Right. I, I have, uh, so people are warming up here. Um, I have another question by uh, Michael Bauer, who says the social cost of carbon estimates are illuminating, but also very sensitive to the ambiguity aversion parameter. How can we settle on a best guess social cost of carbon that accounts for ambiguity aversion? Yeah, um, so let me try to, Qualify the question a little bit because I'm not quite sure we're using best guess in the same sense that I use it in my talk here. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an important question about how do we think about the um, ambiguity aversion, and, and and so the the type of approach that appeals to me and appeals to us comes out of um, a literature called robust Bayesian methods, whereby we have subjective uncertainty. You, um, you you can do some type of uh, calculations about um, uh, so-called constrained or penalized worst case calculations. Uh, one has to bound the amounts of worst, uh, uh, how concerned you are about those worst cases. That's, you know, those parameters I was talking about are, are, are basically penalizing those. The, um, those inputs are not so useful, but what, what are useful are those implied distributions. And so that's, those I think are revealing. We can tell you, for different choices of of, of bounds or, pre, uh, or or say penalizations, here's here's what you're guarding against, and then and then you can look at that and say, does that look crazy what I'm guarding against, or does that look like perfectly reasonable thing I'm guarding against? And so those are the type of the, those are the ways I think are most useful to think about this. What to, to kind of figure out the resulting uncertainties that mo that 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 come out of this that are that are most concerning, and making sure those are not too extreme. And so those calculations come out routinely for us. Thank you. Um, I am just looking at this. Uh, there's two chat functions, so I have to make sure that I don't forget anyone. Um, I saw another question, but it's gone now. Give me one second. Here it is. It's um, uh, uh, Michele Lenza, who says the, the following, uh, or who asks the following, actually. How likely is it? that we don't have to worry about the worst case scenario for climate change, and we can adopt instead policies which are optimal under well-specified probability distributions for different scenarios. Could you just read, read the first part of that again? I want to make yeah, sure, sure. That, that I like address that correctly. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I understand. How likely is it that we don't have to worry about the worst case scenario for climate change? And we can adopt instead policies which are optimal under well-specified probability distributions for different scenarios. Yeah. So now we need to find out what, what exactly we mean by the so-called worst case. Um, so the way that our analysis works is that you know, we cannot let all possible outcomes take place or that uh, uh, the decision-making outcomes will be degenerate, not very interesting. And so now the important part of the, the, the question is, 
how much do you want to bound or how much you want to penalize a search for potential uh, uh, misspecifications or, or reweighting of the different probabilities and the like. And those those are very key parameters in, in, in your calculations. And they and they are what govern this kind of aversion to uncertainty. So when you say how likely it is, we can come out of our calculations and we can show you, we can, we can compare both what the best guess probability outcomes are as well as the worst case ones. And um, of course, the ambiguity tells us we, that I can't tell you the answer to that question, but, uh, uh, but you can inspect that and, 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 and see whether you find the, uh, the worst case one to be far too extreme to be guarding against. So you know, a danger in any type of worst case calculations is you put too much on the table and you end up saying, well, I'm not going to get up in the morning because if I walk across the street, I might get hit by a car or something. I mean, it, 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 there has to be some bounds or limits to this or you just don't get sensible answers. Right. Thank you. That is clear. Um, are there any other questions um, anywhere among the audience, the panelists, the room of eminent experts, of ECB colleagues who I see there in the screen? Um, yes, I see here another question coming in. Um, this is uh, Daniel Kopp. Um, as one example of central bank action, your most recent paper makes reference to a publication from ECB staff, um, uh, Papucci et al. in 2021. You argue that it is only in a second best world without carbon taxation where action such as tilting of purchases is needed to improve social welfare. Are we not in this world? <laughs> <laughs> we are most definitely in that world. <laughs> so now, so, so says, given we're in this world, how much do you want central banks to be filling in gaps of stuff we uh, that, that would be better done by some other um, uh, some other portion of government? And that's a very obviously a very interesting question, a very important question. The more you push towards the central bank trying to do second best fixes for what should be done elsewhere is the more you're going to push central banks into the political realm more and more. And, and, and then the question, then, then that opens the door as to what's the political mandate for, for, uh, for these type of actions. I mean, you know, there's, there's reason, there's sometimes reasons where we assign decision-making power to one entity versus another one. And, and how far do you want to push central banks in terms of that political arena? Um, yeah, I don't have, I, I think for different countries or different, you know, or, or different regions that the answer to that may be very different. Um, but, but I think the more you're going to push that direction, the more you're going to open the door towards uh, uh, embroiling central bank policy into, into, in, 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 into the political realm. And that's, that's a potential cost for it. But I agree that <laughs> I would certainly not argue that our current approach is, is hardly optimal. Um, the point I was trying to make there is if you ask me who has the most potent leverage right now uh, for, uh, for taking action, we should remember it comes from the fiscal side. And, and we should continue to put pressure on the fiscal side of this to be taking important actions. All right. Um, thank you. I, I, I mean, um, here I think uh, I can, I can uh, also myself, um, um, you know, underlying how important it is that central banks remain within their their mandate, legal mandates of central banks differ from one jurisdiction to the other. Um, so I, I also agree with you that some will have a little bit more leeway than others. There's an interesting question, maybe, uh, you know, beyond the uh, boundaries of today's discussion on the question whether if politicians have actually marked a certain line and they have agreed to a, a binding Paris agreement, if they yeah. actually have a policy in place um, um, or at least shown the way um, and if certain of the actions of uh, central banks actually uh, run counter uh, to that uh, mm -hmm. whether we are not placing ourselves um, 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 uh, you know in, in, in kind of like in a reverse way on the chairs of policymakers um, yeah. So that so, so we're not going to sit on their chair to make their to to, to make um, the, the climate policy, but by pursuing our own policies, we make their policies uh, less effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so that is a question that 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 also needs to be uh, needs to be considered. I think. Yeah. Um, if there is no more questions, 
and I'm just going to pause for a couple of seconds here. Um, but if they're not, then I think that that I will uh, just uh, you know take a minute to 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 really uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hansen. I, I think this was a most stimulating discussion. I will give you the last word anyway. Um, uh, but um, uh, I want to celebrate the fact that um, um, issues of climate change have really now landed in the core of what central banking is. This is no longer some kind of like a fringe activity. The best and the brightest within the central banks around the world are now engaging uh, with Nobel Prize winners to get this right. And, and we mm -hmm. know how difficult this is. Uh, uh, and and on a certain, you know on, on 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 a meta level, maybe you have shown us once more to um, to to be aware of the uncertainties, the risks, the the the, 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 the all the things that we don't know uh, on the one hand, and the need <clears throat> to find uh, a way forward. Uh, all actors, um, uh, all public actors uh, in society, private actors in society. By the way, I think that when people think about central banks. The other function that many central banks, of course, have is the supervision of uh, commercial banks. And yeah. I think that the effect that we can have as an institution uh, on this whole issue of climate change might in the end be even more uh, effective on the supervisory side than it is actually on the on the central bank side. So maybe yeah. that is also something. Uh, and by the way, there's lots of uncertainties there as well. Uh, but maybe yeah. that is a field that, that we should focus on. Uh, uh, in the future, uh, even a little bit more. But with that, I want to thank you, thank you uh, greatly. And sure. if there's anything that you would like to leave us with as a last thought, uh, the floor is uh, mm -hmm. yours. So let, let me just amplify on the last point. I do think on the supervisory role, that's a, a very interesting challenge um, going forward. And and I'm just going to go back to a comment I tried to make during my talk and just kind of emphasize that to be effective supervisors, it would be good to think hard about a common way to confront ex measuring exposures to climate change uncertainty. And, and so that regulator and regulated are really on the same page there. And, and given these uncertainties are different, uh, given our amount of historical evidence about these uncertainties are quite limited, I think there's lots of scope there for, um, for thinking hard, hard collectively on how to do that in a meaningful way. Very well. well. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, greatly, sure. greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.